Well, everyone, welcome back to the Catholic Culture Podcast. Before starting today's interview, I wanted to quickly uh, give a big thank you to all of our uh, donors and everybody who prayed for us during Catholic Culture's fall fundraising campaign. Thanks be to God, we made our uh, our matching uh, grant uh, goal, uh, which was uh, finished on um, December 8th on the solemnity of the Immaculate Conception. So uh, we're really happy to be able to serve you for the next year. Please continue to pray for us. And uh, I look forward to bringing you many interesting episodes in the years to come. And by the way, if you only listen to this podcast, um, in case you weren't aware, check out catholicculture.org because we have a lot more going on besides besides just podcasts. And uh, the site's been around since uh, 2003. And this podcast's only been around since 2018. So there's a lot more uh, happening there that you can check out. All right. So uh, today's episode is going to be about a very important and influential uh, medieval theologian and philosopher who has been somewhat overshadowed by uh, the one everybody knows, St. Thomas Aquinas. Uh, Aquinas is the the most important Dominican uh, theologian then uh, Blessed John Duns Scotus is the most important theologian of the Franciscan order. And um, uh, there's a new book introducing us to his thought, uh, Ordered by Love, an Introduction to John Duns Scotus. Uh, the author is my guest today, Thomas Ward. He's a historian of philosophy and theology of the Middle Ages and an associate professor of philosophy at Baylor University. Tom, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me, Thomas. Part of the reason I got this book is because John Duns Scotus is a blessed. You know, uh, if 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 he hadn't been a blessed, then I might have thought, well, you know, uh, I'm sure he has some interesting things to say. Uh, there's a lot of philosophers and theologians in the Middle Ages who had interesting things to say. Why should I, you know, why should I read this one in particular? But the fact that he's a blessed immediately gives him more uh, more standing, and and that's the case even if. You know, uh, in a, in a Thomism dominated, you know, church, uh, he seems to have a lower status than than philosophers from the the sort of more mainstream tradition today. Um, so maybe we could start talking about just who he was as a person and uh, why uh, he was beatified. Yeah. I think first, let me say, I think that's an excellent reason to pick and choose who you're going to read about from the Middle Ages. Uh, there are a lot of people. And does everyone need to know the ins and outs of William Occam's philosophy? No, then he wasn't canonized in any way. So uh, I think you should rest easy um, in in ignorance of him, if, if you are. And then someone like J- Duns Scotus comes along and uh, maybe you've heard some bad things about him, some controversial things, but yeah, he is a blessed. And so for that very reason, I think you're right, deserves to be taken seriously. I do think that he is um, uh, less important than St. Thomas Aquinas, but still important. Um, mm-hmm. Sadly, though, we don't know very much about his life at all. And uh, here, here's basically what we know. He was born in a town called Duns, which is now in Scotland. Um, He was sent to Oxford at an early age, maybe as early as 12 or 13 years old. Some records say that he also spent time in Cambridge, but we're not sure. Uh, He was ordained a priest um, right around 24, 25 years old. and we actually use the date of his ordination to calculate the year of his birth as either 12, 1265 or 1266. Hmm. Uh, he, he made great progress at Oxford. He was a real standout. So they sent him to Paris to continue his theological education and then eventually um, occupy the top level teaching job for Franciscans at the University of Paris, uh, the regent master as the position was known. And Franciscan friars would occupy this chair for about two years and then uh, usually get sort of substitute, substituted out, or ro- rotated out, I should say. And so the next guy up would, would take the chair and then um, the former occupant would then be 
you know, put to work in some other way. And when SCOTUS was, um, what, when SCOTUS was finished in his turn at Regent Master, not too long thereafter, he was sent to Cologne, Germany, where there was a relatively young um, Franciscan House of Studies. It's surprising to historians why he went there. We don't know the exact reason why, because compared to places like the University of Paris and the University of Oxford, or even the University of Cambridge, Cologne was a intellectual backwater. Um, and we really literally just don't know why. There's some, I think, reasonable speculation, but nothing that we can have much confidence in. And unfortunately, he died in Cologne only about a year after he got there in 1308. Um, so the, 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 the motto that summarizes his biography is, uh, you know, the uh, uh, England begot me, France educated me, Cologne holds me. And sure enough, at, at the Minorite church, the Franciscan church in Cologne, Scotus's remains are, are, are entombed. And so, uh, what was, what was the reason that, uh, he was beatified only recently, right? By John Paul II That's in the right. early nineties. Yeah. In 1993. And, um, it was a partial culmination of a long process that started in the first half of the 20th century with, um, uh, a, a greater recognition of Scotus's place in the development of what is now the dogma of the Immaculate Conception. Um, and the idea was if, if this, the, if this middle, middle medieval theologian got it so right about Mary, maybe we should take his, um, his overall thought and his overall life a little bit more seriously with respect to canonization. The problem was that his texts were in quite a disorderly state. And so there were scholarly confusion uh, about which texts were authentic. And of the authentic texts, which manuscript tradition preserved the most accurate uh, versions thereof. So there was um, a commission established at the Vatican, the Scotistic Commission. And the idea was let's uh, uh, get a scholarly team together to come up with authoritative editions uh, of his texts, and then um, he will be able to, you know, be subject to the, the the rigors of the canonization process. So, 1993 represented, like I say, a partial culmination because the hope for many of us is that eventually he might be um, made a saint. But the reason, the the primary theological grounds, at least uh, as given by Pope John Paul II, are one, that uh, Scotus was a defender of the Immaculate Conception, and two, in a kind of colorful phrase, uh, Scotus is a minstrel or poet of the Incarnation. And so for John Paul II, it was the, the combination of these uh, emphases in Scotus, this cosmic centrality of Christ not just for human salvation, but with respect to the whole universe. You know, God becomes incarnate in Christ to be the incarnate king of the whole cosmos, not just the one who saves human beings from their sin. And then two, as closely related to that uh, emphasis on Christ and the incarnation, the dogma of the Immaculate Conception comes along and says, in part, and this isn't the whole story, but in part, that uh, to be the mother of Christ is you know, such, a, such a great honor, uh, part of what God has in mind by preserving the Blessed Virgin Mary from all sin, from the moment of her conception, is as, as a way of both honoring his mom and also honoring himself. Um, so these really do go together in John Paul II's reflections on Scotus's contribution to the church, and, and they were offered as the primary reason for, for his being made a blessed. Now, um, there, Franciscans themselves preserve traditions of Scotus's sanctity, um, okay. but we don't have historical you know, here's, here's, so, uh, 
there were very early biographies of St. Thomas Aquinas, uh, early biographies of St. Francis, you know, as written by, by Bonaventure. Bonaventure had, Bonaventure himself had uh, a very public facing career. And so we know a lot of the facts of his life. Whereas Scotus, you could think of him more as the, um, the quiet teacher who had a, a sort of boldness when it came to defending the, dog, the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception in public, but that wasn't, didn't seem to have been his main you know, modus operandi, so to speak. So unfortunately, there's just a lot that we don't know about his private life. And whether that will be a permanent impediment to his canonization, I can't say. Mm -hmm. Well, another reason I was interested in learning about SCOTUS is that um, in recent months, I've been learning more about St. Francis and the Franciscan tradition. I, I picked up the uh, the complete writings of Francis and Clara from the the classic um, classics of Western spirituality uh, series, and was reading through that. And was reading uh, the Little Flowers of St. Francis. Um, I haven't I haven't finished the whole collection, but I finished that that one part. That's strictly speaking, the Little Flowers of St. Francis, the part dealing with his immediate followers, um, and. Uh, and just getting more intrigued with the early history of the Franciscan order, the, the conflict, you know, with the, the whole spiritual Franciscan uh, crisis. And um, one thing I was wondering about with regard to Scotus is, you know, being uh, an intellectual and a scholar in the Franciscan order, um, because uh, St. Francis was not really, you know, about the the scholarly life, right? He was He was – not about owning a lot of books or, you know, uh, really he was, he was marked by simplicity. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering about how the, um, the development of the, of intellectual life within the Franciscan order took place early on, not just with regard to SCOTUS, but even more generally. Yeah, it's, those are nice observations. You're, you're exactly right. This was a big tension within the Franciscan order. Um, what's interesting is that this, it, it was all the, the tension was almost bound to be there because on the one hand you had, um, the St. Francis's own, um, emphasis on poverty and the Franciscans are a mendicant order. They can't own anything officially, um, or at least from the original inspiration. And yet theological education and uh, formation as um, uh, priests, as missionaries, etc., was was also from a very early period, a big part of what the Franciscans had to do to replicate themselves and to carry out their mission. So as the Franciscan movement spread, they would set up houses where it would be a sort of local home base for their um, ministry. But then as, uh, uh, they, as they attracted vocations, they had to form these people somehow, and that involved some amount of study. So what you find is, uh, wrestling early on with like, well, we can't, we can't just camp outside of Assisi and live in huts the way that St. Francis did at certain points of his, uh, early adventures with his, with his order of little brothers. We have to have some kind of stability, and yet we can't own anything. So they were reliant on, you know, often often when we think of begging, um, we think of, you know, asking for a loaf of bread or something after giving a sermon. But, of course, the Franciscans could get gifts of, say, timbers, you know, trees from a local baron's forest to uh, provide the frame of a house. Uh and if the land that they were building on was donated by a local bishop, then they weren't they didn't own the real estate either. And so they they found ways around these restrictions on owner on ownership. Um, so that by the time you know, the Franciscans arrived it, in Francis's own lifetime, by the way, in England, um, in the early 1220s, by I think 1230. There was a Franciscan house, at least the um, the rudiments of one, in Oxford. Uh, 
which was um, the preeminent university in England at the time. Now, uh, it's one thing it's one thing to recognize the importance of some sort of theological learning, like let's make sure our little brothers know the Bible. It's another thing to think that there's a um, you know, vocational value to studying the philosophy of Aristotle or studying great church fathers or learning, learning a lot about St. Augustine. And that was the tension that the Oxford Franciscans faced, as well as other places too. But the, the, the Oxford Franciscans were blessed with um, Robert Grossetest, a wonderful Oxford scholar, himself not a Franciscan, but as he uh, witnessed the Franciscan movement taking shape in Oxford, he became very attracted um, to their apostolate and so got closely involved and was was personally involved in teaching them and uh, became a, a good role model for uh, going really deep into learning the liberal arts and church fathers and this new stuff of, of Aristotle that was all the rage in, in those days while also holding fast to learning the Bible, um, you know, being saturated in scripture and all of that. So from the 1230s, when Robert Grossetest takes hold of the Franciscan house and sort of makes his mark on it until the 1270s, late 1270s, 80s, when SCOTUS gets there, you know, roughly a 50 year period, there was a really rich intellectual culture that SCOTUS was able to uh, to enter into. Maybe we can talk a little bit um, about the di dispute between the Franciscans and the Dominicans and the sort of how that began, this sort of this thing that people sort of joke about now, um, but there it's still there on an intellectual level, of course, if not, you know, so heated as it once was. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think if you, um, you know, if you say you've gone to a Catholic college and maybe you've taken a few theology, philosophy classes, and uh, and if you if you have anything in your mind about the differences between Franciscans and Dominicans, maybe the issue of uh, univocity versus analogy would come to mind, or something like that. But but that's mm -hmm. not what that wasn't part of the original tension between these two orders, and and the tension wasn't wasn't universal, but there were some issues. One. One kind of um, one pretty distinctive thing is that Franciscans, in general, not universally, but in general, tended to be more suspicious of Aristotelianism okay. than the Dominicans were. So, the early source of the conflict was that uh, Aquinas and other Dominicans, but again, not all Dominicans, had seem to have agreed with certain propositions of Aristotle that were deemed incompatible with the Christian faith. And it was Franciscans who, you know, sort of, so to speak, uh, had their, you know, I told you so moment, like this Aristotle stuff, it's going to get you into trouble, it's going to lead you astray. And for a while, at least they had some ecclesial heft to their assertion. And so you had this uh, this issue of just how much Aristotle should be taken seriously by these orders. Um, that seems to have been the kind of wellspring of the intellectual conflict between the orders. There were also issues about, you know, what we might think of as administrative turf wars, you know, in the university cities anyway, um, which is where the Dominicans and Franciscans would often you know, be in, literally in close quarters, um, you know, the, the, the place of these religious orders within the university was a little bit awkward. It had to be kind of sorted out over time. The orders would uh, lobby for extra places for their students at the university. They'd lobby for extra faculty positions for their own uh, members. And so there they were in a sense competing you know they were they were competing for students student places they were competing competing for faculty positions and then you might think of it as you know, that kind of tension 
uh, erupting into these more serious intellectual um, disputes. But the um, the issues that divide uh, people of a roughly Thomistic outlook nowadays from people of a rust, uh, roughly Franciscan outlook nowadays, they're, they're quite a bit removed from those early concerns about Aristotelianism because there's a consensus now about what aspects of Aristotle's philosophy are and are not compatible with the Christian faith. You know, the Aristotle's hylomorph, hylomorphism, the idea that uh, material objects are com composites of matter and form, and in particular that the human substantial form is the soul of the body, uh, is, is the, excuse me, the, is the rational soul. Um, that, that view is uh, official Catholic teaching. You know, so, so there's a, there's a Aristotelian theme that you know, we all agree on now, at least officially in paper. Um, and then some of the things like, uh, that the universe is eternally old, you know, Aquinas himself never taught that, but thought that it was philosophically defensible. We just know differently from from Revelation that that's not in fact the case. You know, whereas uh, Franciscans tended to defend, um, tended to reject the eternity of the world, both on the grounds of Revelation and on the grounds of philosophy. Uh, you know, so, so these things now, these Aristotelian doctrines are no longer really a source of conflict for any Catholics. And so the, the issues have moved on. I think if we look to today, uh, the main things would have to do with, broadly speaking, you know, ethics and, and cognitive psychology, the exactly how the will and the intellect are related in human action and uh, exactly what our final end is as human beings. And we all, agree, all parties agree that it's God, of course, but exactly what is beatific vision and what are the broader philosophical ramifications of the answer we give to whether beatific vision is primarily an act of the will or an act of the intellect. You know, that, that issue, which was a debate in the Middle Ages, that still animates a lot of, um, discussion, friendly discussion, sometimes not so friendly discussion amongst Thomists and Franciscans. And then I also mentioned this issue about religious language, whether our words, when we talk about God, mean the same thing as they do when we talk about ordinary creatures. The Thomists famously hold that um, our words are at best analogical, whereas Scotus, at least, not all Franciscans, but Scotus, at least, uh, thought that at least some of our words have exactly the same meaning when we talk about God as we do when we talk about creatures. Um, and that has become qu quite a controversial issue in contemporary, you know, not, not merely contemporary, but in the last century or so, that's become quite a hot button issue in the, um, you know, the rarefied air of academic theology. Hmm. Well, maybe we can start uh, with that that notion that you just touched on the university um, thing. So, uh, can you can you situate us in the the philosophical terminology here? Yeah, good. So, uh, university. Uh, I mean, the, if you break it down etymologically, it's a one voice. You know, so the the idea here is sameness in meaning. So when I say um, uh, you know, I, I am a man and you are a man. We're of course two different men, but we, I'm using the word man in exactly the same way, both times. Well, um, so the meanings are univocal. It's the, the, the meanings of each occurrence of the word man is univocal. So now think about, um, uh, a, a case where we talk about God. We, we can say that Thomas is wise and God is wise. Now, in that case, are we using the word wise in each occurrence in the same way, in a different way, or in a somewhat different, somewhat same way? Now, Scotus thinks that we do have 
a concept of wisdom that really does apply to God. And it's the same concept that applies to human beings who are wise or angels who are wise. Now, Scotus thinks God is simple and God is infinite. So his wisdom is infinite and he's related to his wisdom by identity rather than contingently as an accident. Nevertheless, uh, God is wise, um, not in the same degree that humans are wise. He's not related to his wisdom the same way that we are if we're wise. But nevertheless, wisdom in God means the same thing as it means in us, despite those differences. That's what Scotus says. Now, the Thomists, following St. Thomas himself, say that the word wisdom as applied to God can't mean exactly the same thing as it means when we use it to talk about wise angels or wise human beings. And what, what, what's the reason for this? The primary reason is supposed to be that God is related to wisdom by identity. And so when we use the word God, excuse me, when we use the word wise or wisdom to describe God, we are in a sense signifying the whole divine essence. Right? And so the word wisdom takes on this signification that it can never take on when we are using that very term to talk about creatures who are wise or could be wise. And so that vast metaphysical difference between the way that God is related to wisdom and the way that humans re are related to wisdom for Aquinas is sufficient for him to deny that they mean the same thing. <clears throat> so now what do you do with that? So, he's, so he rejects univocity in that sense. So then what does he do? He can't say that they mean totally different things because then when we call God wise, we literally wouldn't know what we're talking about. So yeah. instead he settles on the, his famous theory of analogy, that there is uh, some unity of meaning between wisdom as applied to humans and wisdom as applied to God. But there is also this great difference and uh, this, the, the unity of meaning preserves the intelligibility. We do kind of know what we're talking about, but there's so much more uh, that transcends what we know what we're talking about when we use these terms to talk about God. So that's the theory okay. of analogy. So when, when Scotus uh, says that these terms mean the same thing applied to us and to God, is there a way that he preserves the sort of transcendence and mystery of God uh, in regard with regard to you know the difference between God and man yeah I really do I really do think he does he's often accused of failing to preserve this you know people have read what he has to say about university and they've concluded oh he thinks that God is wise or God is love or God is a being in the same way that creatures are and and so there's this flattening of the ontological gap uh, between god and creatures now what i think is actually the case about scotus is that he has a very robust metaphysical understanding of the vast difference between god and creatures he emphasizes god's infinity and god's simplicity and if you think of God as simple, any attribute that God has is identical with every other attribute and is identical with God himself. And if you think of God as infinite, then all of these attributes, which are really the same as each other, are uh, possessed by God in an in infinite way. So there is this you know, vast difference. Um, God is also the original source or exemplar of, of uh, all of these ways of being. So God's love and God's wisdom are the exemplar of love and wisdom. There isn't uh, a platonic entity of wisdom out there that God and creatures share in. So I really do think that that metaphysical difference is there for Scotus as much as it is for Aquinas. 
But that, that metaphysical difference for Scotus does not have much of an impact on how he theorizes about the meaning of the words that we use to talk about God and creatures. So what he might say is that to Aquinas, if, so to speak, they had been speaking back and forth to each other, uh, they didn't, of course, because Scotus was only nine years old when Aquinas died. So this wasn't a debate that Aquinas and Scotus were directly engaged in. But if we imagine them speaking to each other, we might we could imagine Scotus saying something like, um, Brother Thomas, I grant that uh, God is identical with his wisdom, and so what wisdom signifies when we use it to God, uh, to when we apply it to God, is the whole of the divine essence. I grant that that's the metaphysical situation that we're involved in when we try to talk about God. But still I hold, nevertheless, uh, that the meaning of the word remains the same. And that's important for philosophical theology. After all, as both Aquinas and Scotus agree, what we do in philosophical theology or natural theology is try to reason from facts about creation to facts about God. And that reason, in so, reasoning, insofar as it is deductive, requires stable meanings of terms. And interestingly, when uh, Aquinas uh, offers his theory of analogy, one of the things that he tells us is that is that the words that we use to talk about God must have a sufficiently unified meaning with the words that we use to talk about creatures in order to preserve validity in arguments from creatures to God. Now, of course, for Aquinas, that's not enough for him to adopt a univocity theory. But then Scotus comes along and he says exactly the same thing about the importance of preserving stability of terms across deductive reasoning. And he offers that as the main reason for holding a theory of the univocity of language about God. So on my own, my own hope is that Aquinas and Scotus are actually compatible on this issue and that some of the confusion is exactly how each thinker understands the relationship between metaphysics and what we might call semantics. Uh, and, and also, I think that Aquinas and Scotus understand the very term univocity in slightly different ways. So I think that what Aquinas is rejecting when he rejects univocity is not what Scotus is embracing when he accepts univocity. But I'm sure that I'm sure in heaven they the two have gotten together and have worked out whatever substantive disagreements they have. And my hope is that they would recognize that this one anyway was a merely verbal disagreement. Yeah, that's the impression that I had. So you've you've written this book, Ordered by Love. It's about 150 pages. It's very accessible. Um, I would describe it as beautifully written, uh, but alarming at times. Uh, and, and just in discussing some of Scotus's views on various things, the university thing really didn't bother me. The stuff that freaked me out a little bit had to do with, uh, the will and, um, and also the multiple natures. Um, we, we don't need to get into all of the, the topics. You, you, you divide the book into the, te into 10 chapters dealing with various topics in his thought, concluding with the incarnation and the immaculate conception, which we'll definitely discuss, um, but uh, let me ask as a big picture question, what do you, well, one of the strengths of your book is that, you know, it, it has a very spiritual um, component to it. You're, you're trying to edify as well as to instruct intellectually. And uh, what I would ask is, let's say that somebody reads this book and, you know, disagrees with, you know, 60% of the, the positions that SCOTUS takes on things. Uh, what would you hope, um, other than just knowing more about SCOTUS, what would you hope that somebody coming from maybe a more Thomistic perspective would be able to get out of your book uh, as a Catholic? Yeah, thank you for that question. Uh, sincerely, because uh, sometimes people describe me as a SCOTIST, um, as though I'm an advocate for 
SCOTUS's philosophical and theological positions. And I certainly want to resist that label because I don't think of myself as agreeing with SCOTUS on every point, even the ones that I singled out for coverage here in the book. It wasn't my uh, goal to offer my own evaluation of every topic of SCOTUS that I uh, wrote on, but I did want to present what he had to say as sympathetically as possible. So the issue that you m mentioned about the will is, you know, maybe we could talk about that in a minute, but, you know, that's, that's one, I, I don't know that it freaks me out, but I'm genuinely unsure what to make of SCOTUS's view, even though I, I think that there is enormous spiritual payoff there and, and a plausible intellectual background or in support of the view, I, I still, it departs so much from the Thomist account that I, I'm not sure which way to go. You know, I'm, I'm agnostic, so to speak on that particular point. But so, so I, I would hope that, you know, someone reading the book would be able to, even if they don't end up agreeing with SCOTUS or find the writing persuasive intellectually, would be able to see that SCOTUS should not be uh, thought of, especially by Catholics, as this innovating, disrupting, um, uh, nitpicking figure that he's often made out to be. He was obviously, for, for, for people who uh, read his writing firsthand, you know, even though it's not compellingly written stuff, I mean, he's, he's clearly a faithful Catholic trying to do his best uh, to work out rational philosophical and theological positions that are at least consistent with uh, revelation with the teaching of the church and at many places he uh, offers that the church teaches it as a reason for holding it um, even where he himself couldn't find his way to the church's position on fully rational grounds he was always deferential so you know if you're let's say you're um what, what how a lot of my friends describe themselves an unreconstructed Thomist. you know you're just gonna you're going to follow Aquinas no matter what. I, I hope you can read the book that, yep, he's maybe compatible with Aquinas on this or that issue, fellow travelers, uh, but on on that or that issue, no, he's just wrong, just plain old wrong. I, I know that a lot of my Thomist friends, for example, will really dislike how Scotus understands the connection of the virtues um, because he departs from Aquinas on this and uh, mm, you yeah, know, the, the fact that you could have um, some virtues without having all the virtues, uh, right? Would really... Yeah, that was another place where I wasn't sure about. I mean, it just seemed like it seemed like Aquinas's position on a number of these issues was at the very least more elegant. Yeah, yeah. Uh, whereas Scotus tends to sort of divide divide things up, you know, a little bit more and have more complexity, like with his two, you know, affections of the will, or you know, multiple forms for one thing, and you know, that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. Whether it's elegance or just just being right, <laughs> you know the we we often I I think it's good for Catholic intellectuals to have a decent storehouse, so to speak, of important theologians and philosophers, especially when they are beatified or um, or are saints, who we who we learn from and can draw inspiration from, even if we end up disagreeing with on some important issues. And, and Scotus is certainly one of those. Like I said at the beginning, Aquinas is the preeminent theologian of the church and is my personal favorite, in fact. Um, but I, I know a lot more about Scotus than most people do. And it's a way that I can uh, serve the intellectual culture and, and of, the, of the church and hopefully even help people um, grow closer to God by sharing some of the insights of Scotus in his own intellectual journey, even where he departs from Aquinas. I think he's, he's always interesting. And, you know, whether it's the multiplicity of substantial forms in a human being or exactly the connection between the different virtues and, 
um, or whether the will has one fundamental um, affection or orientation or two or more. You know, Scotus is a distinction maker. He's always trying to find the, uh, the, the conceptual, um, you know, where, where most thinkers would run concepts together. He's trying to pull them apart. And sometimes he's almost too virtuosic when he's in that mode of making distinctions. You know, maybe he could be accused of sometimes making dis distinctions where they don't really need to be made. You know, it's pointless to do so. But that that kind of getting carried away is a lot different from how Scotus is often portrayed, which is that he's just a naysayer. He's just a destroyer of tradition, uh, a destroyer of the intellectual synthesis that Aquinas achieved. And, and it's that uh, nasty take on Scotus that I hope at the very least uh, someone who reads the book sympathetically will come away rejecting. You know, we don't need to see Scotus as a bad guy. Maybe he's, maybe you still think he's wrong on this or that topic, but he's not a bad guy. So his name shouldn't be a byword in the way that yeah, say yeah. William of Ockham's yeah. has to be. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so can you explain, uh, some of uh, Scotus's more controversial positions having to do with the will. Yeah. So the, the, the term here that gets used is called voluntarism. And it's a hard technical term to define because it gets used in a lot of different ways. But probably in the most broad sense, we could say that a thinker is a voluntarist if uh, he or she has a uh, a special emphasis on the role of the will in whatever aspect of philosophy they're talking about. And I know that's quite vague, but Scotus is, is a voluntarist, at least in that sense. Um, in a more specific way, he sometimes gets characterized as a voluntarist because he thought that um, the intellect, the human intellect can never compel the will to will anything. You think, well, what's significant about that? Uh, well, if you are um, a medieval theologian and you are, and you think that our final end as human beings is the beatific vision, which is some sort of union with God, uh, if our intellect it never compels the will to will anything, then here's the, the limit case. You could be in the presence of God. God could be present to your intellect in a way that um, makes it impossible for you to think of another option that would be a better option for you <laughs> at that moment. You know, God is just so in your face, so to speak, that you can't help but judge that uh, knowing and loving God is the best thing for you to do. That's what the intellect, so to speak, hands down to the will. Like, look, you found your final end. In that limit case, someone like Aquinas would say, uh, the will has no options at that point. Like the intellect has found the unalloyed perfect good. So the will simply follows the intellect is compelled to do so i mean of course not it's not kicking and screaming right it's it's found its beloved um, and so its act of willing god is at that point compulsory now scotus had a view of the will on which strictly speaking even in the case of the beatific vision the will is still free now he thought that God gives us a special grace so that, in fact, we do choose God and uh, uh, God preserves us from falling away from that perfect act of willing and loving God. But, but we, and we don't need to go into those details because they are somewhat technical, but uh, that strictly speaking, the will itself remains free either to will for or against God, even in that moment of beatific vision when God is 
perfectly, uh, as perfectly presented to our intellects as God can be. Okay, so then that kind of starts sounding crazy. Like, why would anyone think that the will remains free to reject God, even when God has graced the intellect with this perfect vision of who and what God is, the infinite good? And that seems to open up this uh, rift, this disconnect between the human will and what Aristotle long ago taught was the natural object of the will, namely the good. Right? So Scotus has to theorize, like, if he's going to emphasize human freedom so heavily, how will he theorize this connection between the good and the will? And he has a lot to say about this, but one of the things that comes out in the book is his distinction between two fundamental drives or orientations of the will. Uh, the affection, the affectio commodi, the uh, affection for what is advantageous to oneself, and the affectio justitiae, the affection for what is just or right in itself. And Scotus thinks that the uh, the moral life and the spiritual life are in part a kind of interplay between these two affections. You know, on the one hand, we ought to love God for God's sake and not just because of all the good things that God gives us. But if we're only, so to speak, willing in relation to our affection for what is advantageous to us, we'll never come to see God as lovable for his own sake. And so that's where Scotus will say, you know, by the affection for justice, we really can recognize that God ought to be loved for his own sake, independent of all of the blessings that he gives to us. Um, and even independent of the fact that our ultimate human happiness um, is contingent on loving union with God. And that might sound like a severe sort of spiritual teaching, like too rigorous for real humans. And yet, um, Scotus is a good Catholic and so recognizes that God really loves us and, uh, and theorizes God's love for human beings as having this final end in a loving union with God. So he'll, he's able to recognize that well, part of what it would mean to love God for God's own sake is to want what God wants us to want. And God wants us to be happy and he wants us to want to be happy and to seek to live virtuous and holy lives uh, in part because it's good for us to do so. <clears throat> um, so in the end, what might seem like uh, a tension between you know, loving things for their own sake in accordance with their objective value and loving things for the sake of what they bring me personally, um, this tension is resolved, at least in the case of God, insofar as by learning to love God for his own sake, we come to want what he wants. And part of what he wants is for us to be happy. And so then we will, we can, we can begin to understand how someone might even will their own happiness out of love for God. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, that's cool. Yeah, so so that two wills theory, um, it is controversial. A Thomist will certainly not come anywhere close to using that language. But what what I think we might think of as the the common ground, so to speak, or uh, even if they're not ultimately fully reconcilable on this point, is that both the Thomist and the Scotist will recognize that the fully upright life, the fully flourishing human life will, so to speak, transcend itself in its willing. That, you know, even from a Thomistic perspective where the, where human action has only one fundamental orientation, the good itself, that, um, like achieving that good will involve, uh, getting outside of oneself. You know, it's sort of built into human nature that in pursuing friendship or in pursuing justice or in seeking a lovely, loving union with God, 
we aren't merely looking after our own self-interest, that we really are reaching outside of ourselves to consider the, uh, the good of other people, the good of God himself, and so on. So even if the Thomist will theorize that uh, religious and ethical phenomenon with respect to just one drive of the will, and so might, might think of Scotus's distinction here as otios, um, there is there is that that actual phenomenon that both the Thomist and the Scotist is so to speak getting onto, and so I, I think that's probably the most sympathetic way for the the Thomist to appreciate what Scotus is trying to do, even if mm. in the end the whole two wills thing uh, just he just can't go along with. Let me ask two questions about this then. So, firstly, would Scotus still say that we're we're never choosing evil as such? We're choosing evil under the appearance of good because either way, we're choosing either our own advent advantage or God. Yeah. Do you have to find some good in it? You you have to recognize some sort of benefit to oneself, and so. Um, in so that he's still saying the will is oriented towards good if not the good yeah yeah um he's not like an you know he's not like a total voluntarist in that sense yeah what we might think of as the extreme or total voluntarist would be that like the will could just as easily have um uh, a roll of toilet paper as its final end as it as it has god as its final end you know you just uh -huh. the the aristotelian line is we, we aren't free with respect to ends. We're only free with respect to means. And Aquinas follows that. Um, someone like Occam completely rejects that. Like we choose the end just as much as we choose the means. Mm -hmm. Someone like Scotus represents, you know, kind of a uh, trying to have it both ways a little bit, you know, not completely divorcing the will from its natural end but also opening up this space for a genuine um, multiplicity of ends. Uh, the, now, it, as it turns out, one and the same thing is both that which is objectively the best thing and that which is most conducive to my own flourishing. Um, and Scotus recognizes that, and maybe that's why he wasn't too concerned about dividing up the will in this way. But yeah, later voluntarists would take this in a much different direction and completely detach the will from any naturally given end. And then we're just, and then we have the sort of situation that Pope Benedict XVI warned us about in the, the Regensburg uh, address. And unfortunately, in my opinion, he associated SCOTUS with this bad tradition. Um, but but Pope Benedict, Pope Benedict XVI was concerned about voluntarism for precisely this reason. It divorces uh, the will from rationality. Like if you divorce, if you divorce willing from the good, then uh, willing, so to speak, is is unmoored. And then, you know, could just literally will anything. And so human human life becomes uh, at best, just utter chaos. There's no kind of order or meaning to it. And so we don't want that. Well, I, I think that SCOTUS is very far from that kind of extreme voluntarism. My other question about this is you, you mentioned uh, a person seeing the beatific vision and being able to choose something else. Does this mean that SCOTUS has to come up with a different ex explanation for why once we're in heaven or hell, we're not going to change our decision. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, the first, the the, the short answer is that um, for the blessed in heaven, God gives them a special grace, the grace of firmness of will, firmitas, mm -hmm. and uh, it's the theory it goes like this. On the one hand, Scotus is really committed to this idea that what it is to be the will is to be uh, free and so able to choose between options. And it's that for that very reason, he thinks that the will in heaven still has this freedom uh, because the will doesn't change its nature. 
when it gets to heaven. So he holds on to that, but then recognizes that one of the necessary conditions for perfect beatitude is not just that we persevere in continuing to uh, will love God perfectly, but that we are free from the anxiety or fear that we might eventually fail. You know, imagine, you know, if you, if you know that you could stop <laughs> willing rightly in heaven, you're like, well, I'm really happy now, but what if in a million years uh, something goes wrong? That might spoil your blessedness right now. You know, so it's a, a sort of formal condition on perfect blessedness that you have that um, confidence, serenity of mind that you will go on loving God as you ought to. And so that is the, uh, you know, the ground, so to speak, of this grace of fermitas given to the will so that, in fact, it won't go astray by the grace of God. And we know that we won't go astray because we know that God has so graced us. So, yeah, you know, he has to theorize um, the, uh, uh, the permanence of beatific vision in a slightly different way from the Thomist. So let's move to the reason for uh, John Dunn Scotus's beatification and, you know, the area where people are most likely to be uh, sympathetic with him, obviously. Um, his his thought on the incarnation and the immaculate conception. So his position, as I understand it, is that the incarnation would have happened even if we hadn't sinned as opposed to the idea that the incarnation is um, the result, so to speak, of the fall of man. Yeah, that that's exactly right. And uh, the, the theological reason for that is that God, on Scotus's view, as on everyone else's view, it, God is a perfect lover. So he always loves things. Um, in a, an orderly way, so he always loves himself most of all. It would be unseemly, unfitting for God not to love him, himself most of all. So God, so to speak, if we can imagine a kind of planning out phase of creation um, on God's part, even though you know it doesn't really happen in a temporal sequence, but you know the sort of logical right. ordering in God's mind would be that when he uh, chooses to create, he creates primarily for his own sake and secondarily mm -hmm. for the sake of angels or human beings or so on and so forth. And so what Scotus recognized is that if the primary reason for the incarnation is to fix the human sin problem and restore humanity to its, you know, so to speak, to the original plan before the fall of Adam, mm -hmm. then this amazing event in the history of the cosmos, God becoming incarnate, is uh, an afterthought or a solution to a problem rather than mm -hmm. what God wills for himself uh, primarily. So God primarily wills that, that hypostatic union with the human nature of Christ. Mm -hmm. That becomes the kind of... Um, the master key or the uh, the the stone that you know the the foundation of the whole cosmic plan on Scotus's mm. view and everything else is planned in light of that fact um, and so fixing the sin problem still is an important part of Scotus's overall understanding of what Christ accomplishes uh, on earth obviously he's a he's a Christian theologian but it's not for Scotus, the primary reason why God became incarnate. Hmm. And so how does this all tie into the Immaculate Conception? Yeah. As, um, as I'm sure you know, you know, Protestants who uh, object to Catholicism because of its Marian teachings will often say that the dogma of the Immaculate Conception detracts from the honor that we ought to give to Christ as the one savior of all human beings. And that it, it, at first glance, uh, 
The dogma seems to make Mary exempt from needing salvation in the first place, and so uh, contradicts the Bible and dishonors Christ and so on. And of course, as Catholics, we know that that's not true, but it, it's nice to be able to give a response to Protestants who make those objections. And I myself was raised a Protestant, an evangelical Protestant, and uh, for some time of my adult life, the Marian dogmas uh, did give me pause. And so it's, uh, and most of my friends and family are still Protestant. And so it's on something that's on my heart and not just, you know, as part of my intellectual vocation to think well about, about, uh, about Mary. And what Scotus has to say is that to, to think of Mary as uh, immaculately conceived, in fact, gives greater honor to Christ than otherwise. And here's why he says that. There are several ways in which uh, a savior can save. I mean, if you imagine, um, uh, you know, someone falls off a cliff and then the person who goes and brings them back up off the cliff, that's a savior. <laughs> But someone could also be a savior by preventing someone from falling in the first place. You know, if you were going to fall, but then you were held back from falling, well, that person is your savior. You know? And what Scotus says, and this is reflected in the language of the dogma, it's that it's by the merits of Christ that Mary was preserved free of original sin. The way in which Mary was saved saved by preservation, is a singular way. Scotus thinks that there's, we have no reason to think that anyone else was saved in this way. But by being preserved, Mary was saved no less than any other human being was saved. And it's fitting that Christ would save some at least one person in this way to demonstrate the whole range of his saving power. Yeah, if we if we think, well, it's like maybe if you climb down the cliff and get the person and bring them back up, that at on the surface that looks more impressive than if you just hold the person <laughs> to prevent her from falling in the first place. But you know, that's just an analogy. If you think about the reality here, you know, it's Christ accrues these merits by his perfect life, his innocent suffering, and so on. And he can uh, apply them in whatever way he likes. And part of what God is doing in Christ in the universe is you know, manifesting his awesomeness. And so to have examples, so to speak, of all the ways in which his salvation can be applied to humans is like a, a good way of showing his awesomeness. So that's all on the side of Christ. That... Uh, the, the teaching of the Immaculate Conception gives great honor to Christ. But of course, uh, it also gives great honor to Mary as the uh, uh, most honorable human being ever to live, as the one who said, uh, let it be to me according to your will, to the angel, um, accepted that cooperation with God to bring Christ into the world, and so is quite deserving of all of that honor. Even though, the, even though the way in which she is meritorious does not compel God to create her in an immaculate way, you know, that would be like, that would be basically a sort of Pelagian move that if we could have good enough behavior, then God would be obligated to take us to heaven. Like, no, that's not how the gospel works. Um, so even if Mary is totally free from sin, that doesn't obligate God to choose her as the one through whom he will enter the world as a baby. But still, even though there's no obligation here, we can recognize the fittingness of it. It's fitting for God to come to the world in a perfect human being. It's fitting for God to honor his mother in this way. Um, God is still free but he is reasonable in his freedom and so acts in this fitting way, free from obligation. So both 
So the dogma honors both Christ and Mary in these superlative ways. And Scotus, at the time uh, that Scotus defended the doctrine in roughly the way that I've been describing, it was a controversial view. Um, everyone thought that Mary was cleansed of original sin at the moment right after her conception. So she was conceived in original sin like we all are, but then out of um, the fittingness to have the uh, 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 pure receptacle for his incarnation and so on, that God cleansed her of that original sin. So she had it, you know, for like one millisecond. Huh. Okay. So all of the theologians at the time had got that far. Interesting. Um, and what Scotus did was give the the extra little something needed for um, to, to make it make theological sense for Mary to be preserved altogether from sin. And that extra something was precisely that point I mentioned earlier about um, preventing someone from falling mm -hmm. is itself a way from a, a way of saving that person. Mm -hmm. And so that was Scotus's little innovation that. Uh, allowed him intellectually to defend the view. Now, it still was controversial, but he, uh, you know, he, he got the better of the argument in the end, as we all know. Hmm. Wow. Yeah, it's amazing. Uh, is there anything else you'd like to say about SCOTUS before we wrap up? You know, one thing I try to do in the book is, um, situate SCOTUS uh, as a Franciscan. And in a lot of history of philosophy and theology, that's not always made clear. You know, it's not unknown. Everyone knows that he is a Franciscan. But in what sense is his thought Franciscan? And uh, it's something I was, I was keen to try to sort through in the book. Hmm. And I think that the, um, you know, the Franciscan emphasis on love on the the this sort of paradox that joy comes through suffering um, you mentioned your reading of the little flowers and this is a, a theme of a lot of the early brothers is their suffering in the way that francis is asking them to they discover that that's really the source of joy and you know and sometimes scotus is seen as a, a harsh kind of figure because of the way in which he emphasizes the love of god for god's own sake mm -hmm. um and not for the sake of what he gives us. Right. But I think that uh, rather than seeing in that a kind of proto-Calvinism, we should ins instead look backward to the person who actually had an influence on Scotus, which was Francis, mm -hmm. um, and the life of Francis and the early generations of Franciscans who would have had would have preserved this uh, very close memory of the sanctity of their founding father. And Francis seems to have understood that connection between self-denial and joy. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that's a big theme of Scotus's voluntarism. You know, we don't, we don't, if, if you read in Scotus that he rejects the idea that we necessarily will our own happiness. You think, oh, you're kind of busting up the whole Aristotelian thing and the way in which that was Christianized so beautifully in thinkers like Aquinas. And in one sense, he is departing from it, but he's not hes not busting it up. But insofar as we can find the spiritual uh, inspiration for that rejection that we always will our own happiness, I think we should look to Francis. Um, and what we find is that by focusing on things that were more important than himself, uh, Francis, in Chesterton's words, was the happiest person who ever lived. Mm. And so in the end, it is there is something harsh or ascetical about it, and yet it is also the path to joy. And so um, what I one thing I hope for the book is that uh, although, it's not pervasive in every single chapter that that Franciscan background will, uh, will really shine out. So I, I just wanted to highlight that a bit more. We've already, I know we've already talked sure. about that and appreciated the earlier questions about, um, about the Franciscan movement, but yeah, that, that really was 
really on my mind and my heart as I was writing the book. Oh, well, great. So yeah, again, the book is uh, Ordered by Love, an introduction to Don, Don Scotus. And uh, thank you very much. Yeah, there it is. Thank you, uh, Tom, for coming on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me, Thomas. I really appreciate it. I enjoyed the conversation. All right, everybody. Uh, my next episode will be probably the last before Christmas, and uh, I'll be talking to uh, Dennis McNamara, who was on the show recently, and uh, another guest about uh, a new book on uh, solemnities and how to celebrate them. So you can look forward to that uh, to prep you for the uh, the late December and early January solemnities coming up. Thanks, everybody, for listening, and I'll see you next time.